okay, so now we're gonna come to the, the next part of the night and I'm really excited for this um, uh, and to have the opportunity to have um, Mudit join us. Um, he's been amazing as a support to me in terms of questions I've been asking and what we've been working on and um, is always available and, and making his time to us. And I, I can't wait to hear his story. I'm, I'm gonna call on another superb alumni friend who's been so kind and gracious to me over the last couple of years and Daniel Warner from my remote clinic uh, to come and host the fire night, uh, fireside uh, chat. And uh, Daniel has, um, has been opening doors, introduced me to Marsha, introduced me to Eva, um, uh, John Albright, uh, and uh, just uh, been a constant support of uh, and force of we can do this and we will do this and we'll get it done. Uh, in our world. So Daniel, I'm going to ask you to come forward and, and turn things uh, turn things over to you. Thanks for having me back, Chris. I'm starting to feel like the Ricky Gervais of Shuluk Startup Night uh, with, uh, with the return engagement. So thanks for having me back. I, I really enjoy it. Uh, I love hearing from other founders and VCs, and I really love watching the startup pitch competition. I kind of miss being a judge, Chris. Uh, but this community is so amazing, and you're such an amazing uh, leader. And congratulations again on the well-deserved uh, promotion to Director of Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And uh, Vito's here as well. Special shout out to Vito uh, for all your hard work as well with the Shulik Startup community. Uh, you guys are really leading the charge and I really wish that this existed when I was at, uh, at Shulik. I wrapped up in 2015 and, and that's how I got to know Mudit. Uh, I can't see you Mudit, or how do I shift my screen around? <clears throat> I'm here, my friend. Okay, Can there you, you are. Me? Wow, nice hair. I'm really Thanks, jealous. Man. That's fantastic. How you been? I'm good. How are you? Good. I've been hanging in. You know, it's been a weird eight months, but we're all we're all hanging yeah. in. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's everyone's uh, hanging in. I hope I hope you've been doing well. And how's your wife doing? Wife's great. Good. Thanks for remembering I'm married. Yeah, I do. I, I don't remember <laughs> what I have for breakfast, but I remember people that people are married or not or have children, uh, and usually yeah. what, what school they went to and some other weird quirky <laughs> things like people's baseball stats and stuff like that. Well, it's really great to have you here. Uh, like time really flies, right? It's been about like seven years. I still remember the last time you and I hung out. Uh, it was at some lobby bar. You were telling me all about Herbery. Uh, <laughs> you know, tell, why, don't, why don't you tell everybody about your startups and a bit about your background first, and then I'll dive into uh, the questions that I have prepared. For sure. Uh, I mean, thanks again for having me, uh, folks at Shulik. Um, you know, it's funny uh, when I reflect on Herbery now, actually, because during COVID and this pandemic, and everybody thinks that grocery startup, grocery delivery startup is the best idea and everybody keeps asking me to go do it again. Uh, so uh, it's just funny how life comes around full circle. But, uh, you know, just to give you guys a quick background on myself, I was in Shulik 10 plus years back. So I feel really old now. Dan and I went to school together. Uh, we hung out in, this, in school together. So that's a lot of, some good memories there. Um, post, uh, post graduating from Shulik, I did the regular uh, things that Shulik graduates typically like to do, which is get into some sort of consulting, uh, management consulting role. Uh, I graduated in the last uh, financial crisis in 2008 uh, with Dan, uh, so that was uh, that was interesting. And uh, you know, I, I got into the one job that I could find, which at that point was uh, becoming a BDR at Oracle, uh, not knowing exactly how to sell anything. Uh, so did that as my first gig out of school, and then from there uh, went to CGI. Uh, somehow got into this idea of internal consulting uh, slash management consulting. Uh, and as kind of life went on, I ended up at a, at a small company called Sobeys and Corporate Strategy, uh, which is where I got absolutely fascinated by the world of retail uh, and how uh, retailers operated and how much, uh, you know, the, the, how much uh, room existed for disruption to happen in that world. Um, long story short, I quit my uh, company eventually uh, and started my first startup, which was called Herbery, which at that point, this is, I'm trying to think of the year, probably 2015, 16-ish. Uh, then you were still uh, at uh, Snapsaves. Snap yeah, Snap I think it was, yeah, I think it was before yeah. required, so I'm pretty sure it was like you were You were in Chicago, actually. I remember yeah, you were, you yeah, were yeah. back in Chicago, yeah. Uh, and uh, we started Herbery, which at that point became uh, Canada's first on-demand grocery delivery app. Uh, Dan knew all about Instacart, so he was like, dude, this is so cool. I use Instacart in the U.S. This is great that you're doing it here because we can use it because I'm moving back. Um, so did that for about two years. A uh, lot of learnings. Uh, I call it, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, look at it from a outside looking in, it looks like a failure because you eventually had to shut down uh, like many startups do. But I think that that was one of the most critical things that in my life 
because of all the learnings I had and all the relationships I made uh, in the in the community. Um, so did that did that startup for about three years, uh, raised some money, eventually uh, you know couldn't raise our next round of funding. Uh, things looked bleak, uh, and we decided to close shop. Uh, my journey wasn't done as an entrepreneur, uh, and I decided to pretty soon build another startup, uh, which was called Nexus Commerce, uh, which was uh, in the same realm of uh, the idea of e-commerce, uh, but really focused on helping large CPG brands. So think about Nestle, think about Unilever, some of these large, large CPG companies, uh, and really help them figure out what e-commerce, uh, specifically in direct-to-consumer world, meant. And you know, direct to consumer now is cool and sexy, uh, but when we were doing it, uh, Dollar Shave Club had just been acquired for about a billion dollars by Unilever. So it was just becoming normal to become a direct to consumer startup. And a lot of CPs were struggling to figure out how to become innovative and lean and agile and how do we build those, those kind of organizations internally. So we built that uh, and uh, had some success in that. And we eventually sold that company uh, last year. Uh, so went through an acquisition process, uh, which was great. Um, and uh, stayed on for, stayed on for about a year. And Dan will tell you more about this if you ever talk to him. That building a company is easy, but selling and staying on is one of the hardest things you could ever do as an entrepreneur. Uh, I would they say they're all worth, hard, but they're very worthwhile. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they are worthwhile, exactly. And uh, yeah, so I uh, so stayed on off for about a year. Uh, my whole idea was, and this is this is this year. So my whole idea was I wanted to take a break, do nothing started angel investing a little bit, helping startups, mentoring and all that. And I was gonna go travel uh, with my wife. We had this whole European tour planned and, and, and then COVID hit. So here I was stuck in Toronto back again, uh, trying to figure out what to do next. And uh, you know, one of, the, one of my really good friends uh, called uh, and he wanted to forever wanted to build a holding company which could go and acquire the companies. And he wanted me to come and join him and help him do those things. So now I'm part of this, uh, this holding company uh, I have a fancy title, uh, which could mean a lot of different things, but uh, I'm right now focused on M&A uh, and trying to find some really interesting companies that we can acquire. I spend a lot of time in some of those companies as a, call it an interim COO, so helping them restructure, build a clean business, and then I leave and then let the teams run while we go look at other companies to acquire. So I've said a lot and I'll pause, uh, but that's what I've been up to in the last 10 years. Thank you for the overview. I mean, I have a lot of questions with regards to like what yeah. you shared. Like I, I still remember when you were thinking about leaving Sobeys and you had such a cool yeah. corporate job. Uh, I think it was in, it was in uh, innovation or, or, or corporate strategy. And, uh, you know, take us through in like, you know, a couple minutes, like what was going through your head and what ultimately, you know, what did the little voice in your, ha- in your head say, excuse me, about like making that leap, right? Because a lot of people think about it, but you actually did it. Yeah, you know, to be honest, it was easy for me uh, because I was young. Uh, I had I had age on my side as I think about this. Uh, and you know, the other side of it was I think back in the day, startups became sexy. You know, everybody <laughs> thought they could become Mark Zuckerberg, including myself. Uh, what we didn't really realize at that point in time was how hard it is to actually build a company from from zero. Um, you know, so you know, it was easy transition to make because everybody was building a startup, honestly. Uh, I was lucky because a um, I had a I had a family support system um, who would uh, who would be sorry I'm getting a message that I should go on landscape so let me go on landscape give me a second there we go you can now see bigger version of me mm-hmm. uh, and, oh but that messes up my camera so well, hold on guys living in the life of Zoom is interesting. there we go is that better Vino give me that a thumbs up, up a little if you bit. think it, yeah couple degrees I'm on up. A, I'm on an iPad. Okay, I'm in I'm in the office by the way, so <laughs> that is why. All right, or I can you know what I can just bend myself down a little bit. Or you can lie down. If you lie down, we should probably be able yeah. to see you. Sorry, Vina, we're gonna go back on uh, on the other mode because this is not working out. <laughs> oh, it's all good. It's all good. We can still hear you. Don't worry. Yeah. There we go. Perfect. Um. Where was I? Oh, quitting, quitting my job. Yeah, so it was actually a fairly easy decision for me because you know I was lucky that I had backing up my family, my girlfriend who's now my wife. Everybody thought I was in, I was crazy, but they supported me. Uh, you know, so I kind of worked out. But uh, you know, I get that question a lot now by other entrepreneurs, and I always tell them that you should really think hard about what being an entrepreneur means and what sacrifices you have to make because it's not an easy journey. It looks easy on TV. It looks easy when I speak about it. When you write about it, it looks really easy but it's not. And uh, 
you have to sacrifice uh, your life, your friends, your mental health, which is a big, big part of this. You know, a lot of founders are not talking about this, um, you know, uh, and it's not an easy place to be. So think a lot uh, before you build a startup. And uh, one of the things that I now say is, if you're not truly passionate about a problem and you're just doing it because it's cool and in trend, probably not a good idea to build it. You know, you gotta be super passionate. Dan, you're a great example of this, right? You have a story of why you build medicine and I love that story and I believe in that story. You have to be. Adil's gonna join us in a bit. There's a reason why he's building Swift. You know, he was in yeah. that ecosystem, understood it, loves it, obsesses about it. Um, so, you know, that's you my to, kind of- You have to really that. wanna solve that problem and yeah. through hell and high water, you're gonna get there. And it yeah. doesn't happen the first time, might not happen the second time. Look, people pivot, people fail, yeah. which is gonna be my next question for you. So you really have to commit yourself to solving that problem. Don't fall in love with your solution, fall in love with the problem. And you just called this medicine, yeah. which we were for the first two odd years, learned a lot during COVID uh, by spending a lot of time with our customers and came out of the other end with uh, a B2B pivot that we think is gonna be really special. Nice. Uh, yeah. But uh, well, you and I will talk about that a little bit more. I really wanna ask you now about the end of that first event adventure. You told us like how you shifted into it. And and I definitely remember that phase, uh, you know, cause we spent some time together. Um, but no one really talks about pivots, let alone how to actually wind down. So can you talk to us a little bit about that experience a little bit? And, and you know, just like, you know, yeah. building a startup and bootstrapping and fundraising is all scary and being successful is, you know, with, uh, with a potential exit or, uh, you know, liquidation opportunity is all really exciting. It's what we all want, right? Solve the problem and make sure that, that uh, everyone who's on your cap table does really, really well. But like, how did you decide to close your business? And like, what steps did that actually involve? Because that's a hard decision too. Yeah. when to actually say, you know what, I've, I've given it a yeah. really good shot and uh, I need to stop. I remember that day really well, actually. Uh, we were also doing a pivot, or trying to do a pivot and trying to figure out how can we become a B2B company. Uh, the mistake that I made while I was making the pivot was I didn't realize when you become a B2B company, what happens to your cash flow, uh, you know, for, for our people are listening, if you're a B2C company, you probably get paid by your customers, let's say in seven days, best case scenario, Stripe sends you money or Shopify will send you money pretty quickly or based on what time you, you set up. If you're working with Unilever, good luck trying to get your money in 60 days. Uh, and these are big chunks of capital, right? I'm doing a POC for $100,000 and I've invested $100,000 from my bank to fund a project and I'm not gonna get the money for 60 days. Uh, it's a very, very different problem to solve from a financial standpoint, you have to be set up properly for it. We were not, uh, and that was a, we just thought again, you know, being being foolish entrepreneurs and excited about solving problems, we just didn't think about that repercussion, and it really killed our company at some point in time. We just couldn't sustain it anymore financially, uh, and as our pivot was semi-successful, we were still not, you know, what we call, we were still not a product market fit. We were getting some interesting, uh, you know, uh, conversations going with VCs. We were trying to raise a Series A back then, uh, but nothing was being committed. And all I could see was the bank account dropping. You know, that, that's a bad feeling. When you've got payroll coming up and there's no money in your bank account, you have depleted your personal line of credit, your credit cards, you're done. You as a, as a personal uh, check to the company are done. The company's the accounts are done. It's a tough day. And I remember that day quite well. I remember I had a meeting with a, with a VC that I thought will invest in us. Um, and then they did not for, for some right reasons. And I knew that was it. So I had to come back to the office. I remember we were at the DMZ. Uh, again, a space I think we both have shared at some point in time mm -hmm. in our life um, up at Young and Dundas. And I had my team sitting, uh, and I was very quiet. I, and I'm never quiet. I'm a, I'm a you know, happy guy, and I'm always like trying to get people excited. And they could notice that I was very quiet. I had like four people sitting in front of me. Uh, and I had to basically take, I, I took one of them out, and I had to tell them what happened because I had to share that with somebody that I think we're done. Uh, and that was kind of the starting point of that is sort of basically telling everybody individually saying, I think we're done. Um, I don't think we can afford paying payroll anymore. I don't think if this company will last. And that's kind of the wind up process started from there. Um, the, the one thing that I am, you know, really proud of that process though is um, I was able to place most of the people in some sort of new jobs, you know, pick up the phone, call people, find referrals and say, hey, I've got great talent. Would you like to have them? And we were a small team, so it wasn't like, you know, I wasn't trying to play 100 people, but uh, the four or five that were left at that point of time, I think most of them were able to find uh, a new job. And, you know, I'm so, so proud of these things. Just uh, a month back, I just had a bunch of people over and they were all herb re reunion uh, party, all socially distanced uh, in our mm -hmm. backyard. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, it, uh, that's kind of uh, the only proud moment of that of that time that most people were able to go back on their feet pretty quickly. Uh, we wound it down. I tried, you know, longing the journey, but it didn't work, and we eventually shut down. I appreciate you sharing. Uh, there's usually not enough of those stories that are out there, and they definitely happen a lot. So I yeah. appreciate that you're sharing that with the, with the group today. Um, you've invested in a number of, of startups, uh, including uh, ShipSwift, uh, who's here with us tonight. Uh, you know, what drove your decision to back them? And, and, and as an angel investor, we should chat, by the way, um, you know, what do you really look for in a, in a team yeah. and, and in a startup? Yeah, Adil will tell you the story, maybe if he's on it. Uh, I wrote a blog on this that, I, that I'm really passionate about funding entrepreneurs that have a balance between vision and execution. Um, I think I, like a lot of people, end up being on one side of the funnel. I'm a super big vision guy. Sometimes I leave the execution to the smart people in the room. Uh, you know, uh, but I always like to find people who understand both sides of it. They may not be good at it, but they understand it and they're building a team that can, that can do both sides of it. And I thought this is a great example of that. I think it's brilliant at trying to balance it. Uh, so that's kind of what I look for. Uh, you know, there's another company called Yuko, uh, which is... Uh, which is uh, in agritech, uh, which is great. Invested in Kabul, which is just blowing up because they're on Dragon's Den. Uh, Vino, who's an uh, incredible entrepreneur. But you know, one of the common themes that I find when I talk to these folks is that is that similarity of the, the balance that they have. You know, uh, from there, uh, we obviously get into uh, industries or spaces I like or I understand better. Um, you know, and then if it's if it's a, it's a certain technology that I am interested in, that's kind of where I go with. But uh, um, but really to me, it's about the entrepreneur. And you know, uh, this is probably, and you see this too, we're, we're, when you're an angel investor, you're at the highest risk profile uh, and you're taking shots at, at an idea really early. So, you know, product market fit is interesting, but really like, how do I really know you'll get there? Cause it's too early. So, you know, I, I like to see some validation on it, but really it's all about the, the people that are building it. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you. Um, so I know that you're back. Which one is that? I know you've got three kids. So which one, which one did just pass by? Well, none of them are sleeping here. Come on in. Do you yeah. have a question for my friend? She usually uh, talks to a lot of her clients and team members. This is Olivia. Aww. Say hi, everybody. Hi, yeah. Working from home is fun. Eh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah. Lots of fun. Say hi, everybody. Mm. I went to school with some of these people. That's Chris. You, may, you might know Chris. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Marsha's here somewhere. Marsha's here. She's not on her camera. Uh, but I think I know one more name that's in the Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> she'll, she'll, uh, Chris, she'll do the next interview, okay? I Deal. know who it is. Yeah, MBA 2040 right here. Chris is one of the oh. guys from Wildcraft. Yeah, he's he's on the Wildcraft, exactly. All right, she's just going to take over if I don't uh, ask <laughs> the next question. Uh, so you've been back in the classroom, uh, coaching ventures, investing. Now you're keynoting tonight. How are you enjoying being back in the Shula community uh, where, where we all started? It's, it's awesome, man. Like, you know, I was, I've, I've said this to Chris uh, now on a few occasions that when we were in school, this was, it wasn't like that. You know, we didn't have this, uh, this incredible community of people that were thinking about entrepreneurship at that scale that we're doing right now. I think, I don't know how many people are on this thing, but usually you get 300, 400 people. That's incredible uh, to just come and watch a guy like me speak, like, who am I, right? Like, but that's that's the power of this community where people are interested in it. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to be part of it, helping. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm really excited for Chris's uh, new mandate and, you know, really evolving that and supporting it. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, it's just impressive to even see how many students want to pitch, right? I've been, I was part of uh, a competition, I think, two, two, two uh, Sulik nights before, started nights before, and just, just the great quality of pitches. You know that are, that are coming up. It's it's incredible. Uh, so yeah, kudos to the team, and I uh, and I can only say that I'm super excited to see what's uh, what's coming up in the future. Yeah, a future's bright. Uh, I really uh, can't believe how far this has come, Chris. It's really outstanding. Yeah. And I, yeah. and I love all I love all the events. Um, so what? Uh, so like maybe like with regards to like. You know, I guess starting a business, let alone growing a business, when you're starting your own business, because there's you know, 100 plus people here, what advice would you have for the students when they're like considering to, to launch their own business? Um, be super passionate about the problem you're solving. We talked about that a little bit. Um, the second thing that I, that I notice now a lot of people who are trying to build businesses is they don't quite understand the industry that they're trying to build. Again, I'll use Adil as a guinea pig of this because he's on this call. <laughs> he's a startup. 
uh, you know, one of the things that I liked about Swift a lot was that Adil came from the world. He came from Amazon. He knows exactly what building a fulfillment network means. Um, and so it's, I think it's super important to have the domain expertise. Oh, another one. Uh, it's not just, it's, uh, you know, uh, Why you? hey guys, where's the third if, one? If the baby shows up, I might need to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is this is Olivia. The, this is Emma. Uh, I'm trying to get them in in the uh, in the business mood. They, they're they're helping their mom create a balloon decor business right now of their office next door. Amazing. So yeah, that's amazing. Next is their own Shopify store at five and six, right, Mudi? <laughs> exactly. That's the way to do it, right? Just ask them to become uh, become super ingrained in understanding how balloons work, and they'll be good. So yeah. So uh, really, it's all about that. that passion, all that's great. Balance of vision uh, and uh, and the executions. It's awesome but also understand the industry you're trying to build the product and solve the problem in. Without that, you know, you're just kind of making assumptions that you may not actually fully understand. Um, you know, it's easy to look at very successful entrepreneurs, you know, we take Mark Zuckerberg as that example, you know, who may not have been a social network genius to build a company, but those people are very few in the world. Uh, you know, uh, not everybody gets there. So having that domain expertise, you know, Dan, again, in your case, you knew CPGs when you were doing Snapseed, like yeah. you should that role, right? <laughs> And really well. And then your personal experience in the medical industry, you being a patient, you know, you understand the domain really well. You've dug in that work. I think that's super important. Without that, you're you're gonna be lost and you're not gonna have smart conversations with people who you need to actually either have become part of your team or investors who need to invest in you, um, or your customers, more importantly, who who have to buy a product eventually. Absolutely. What are your uh, like ride or die metrics when you're getting going? You said you're like half strategy, half in the trenches. So, you know, what were the, uh, you know, That's the just, what, was mo- what was most important to you as you were growing your business? I think it, uh, they probably, uh, they're slightly different probably for a B2C versus B2B. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, you can really, really kind of think about that. But I think about those KPIs and probably a couple of buckets, customer centric buckets. So think mm-hmm. about your, um, you know, uh, if you're a, if you're a post revenue company, I'm just going to assume you are. You know what's your revenue and how fast are you growing? Uh, and CSAT, do customers love you and do they come back to you? So your repeat rate probably early stage. And again, it kind of changes as you evolve as a company. Right? When you're super early stage, you're thinking about product KPIs. When you're when you're at a Series A stage, you're thinking about growth. You know, Series B, you're thinking about expansion. Like so, it just depends. But I would really think about breaking them down into uh, into uh, buckets like clients facing KPIs and internal KPIs, which are margin, you know, if you're in, if you employ satisfaction, those kind of things. So, sorry, I've, it's a vague answer to a very important question, but I think the answer, I'm gonna put my consultant hat back on is it depends. Yeah, I think now more than ever, like it, things have really changed, right? It was almost like grow at all costs and just, you know, get as many yeah. users as possible. And, yeah. and, you know, I feel like a lot of us drink that Kool-Aid, but at the end of the day, like you might be building a startup, but it really is a business. It needs the right foundations. So I think that that's yeah. been a big wake up yeah. call for a lot of, you know, if, 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 if you're, if you're a company, you know, maybe I'll simplify that a little bit. If you're a company that has a product that's in the market, you got to look at both top line and bottom line. You just can't be, I just want to grow the business. Uh, and I, I lose a dollar every time I sell it. I don't want to build a Casper like business, right? Uh, I don't think it's a smart way of doing business. And I think people forget that gross margin is a great indicator. <laughs> and if you don't have positive gross margin, not net gross margin, you're probably not building an interesting business. And if you're just paying people to buy a product, maybe you got to rethink your, your go to market strategy or your pricing strategy. So, um, you know, uh, those are some of the key things. Uh, you know, I've simplified it a lot. Some people can argue and say you can have a negative gross margin, and there are use cases for that for sure. Uh, and that could be a marketing tactic you apply. But really, at the end of the day, you know, as, as MBA students or business grads, you have a PL, uh, you have revenue, you have cost. And at the end of the day, a number spits out. Uh, it's, your, it's your margin or profit. So you gotta, you gotta be, you gotta be uh, careful of both. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, like, tell us a bit more about um, the second company. I'd love to learn more, a little bit more about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, one of the things, one of the beauty of being an entrepreneur is once you've done it, uh, the second, third, fourth time probably is slightly easier only mm-hmm. to start. Only to start, not to build. You know, there's, a, there's a different types of journeys you got to do start, build, expand, launch. Uh, so, uh, expand and go become a rocket ship. Uh, a lot of times when you're building your first startup, there's some basic things you got to do that as a first time entrepreneur takes you time. Uh, it could be as simple as incorporating your company. 
uh, all the way to building a website to having a nice landing page, what are the basic things are? And when you're doing it the second time, third time, those are the easier things. You kind of accelerate your pre-work pretty quickly, which is easy for, which is good for us. Um, the other interesting thing, and probably we got lucky, uh, but this comes back to being domain experts was me and my co-founder both were at least seen in the market as domain experts. We may not be, but we were, we were seen like that. So uh, it helped us get those clients very early in the business. You know, we, we started a company when we had clients, which doesn't normally happen. Uh, we had product market fit before we started the company, I guess, in, in certain ways. Uh, and we had paying clients who wanted us to build a company and we did build a company eventually. So it kind of, uh, it was easier that way. Uh, but again, you know, as you start up building it, uh, the growing pains are the same. We were, we were, you know, we will struggle with finding new customers. We will struggle with margin. We will struggle with growth, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that we, we fundraised a little bit. So we had all those challenges back again. But because we had done some of that in the past, we had a lot of learnings and we were kind of able to overcome the challenges faster, I would say, um, and then build it. Uh, you know, one of the things that we always, uh, you know, hindsight 2020, so I don't, I don't reflect on this a lot, but sometimes when you meet uh, the people part of that business, including investors, uh, you know, they always say, hey, we shouldn't have sold the company because they see the COVID the aspect of it and they only say, oh, imagine if you were still an independent company, how much more your valuation could have been. But I always say, man, who knew COVID will happen, right? So we saw there was the right timing at the right time. We were at a crossroads at that point in our business. We could have expanded more. We would have had to raise more capital. I wasn't sure if we'll be able to do it. So, you know, one of the things that we had was an exit option and we decided to take. And uh, that's kind of the second story. It's, it's, a, it's a very simple business actually that we built. It was clients wanted to do work with us. They wanted to pay us. We said, sure, we'll do the work and we'll take the money. Uh, it's the best kind of business you should build. That, that is the best kind of business you should build. Absolutely. <laughs> it's just, that's the advice to your kids, right? Yeah. If somebody wants to pay you for a service, take the money, but make sure you provide them excellent service because they'll come back. Are you listening? What? He's very smart. Um, and so like with regards to like the fundraising, no. <laughs> I'm sorry. He's like, no, <laughs> <laughs> she, she takes it all in. Um, yeah. Like with regards to the fund, uh, funding for your first two companies. And then I want to ask you just yeah. about the third that you're doing now. Uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of ways to get funding and like, you know, it certainly isn't, isn't necessarily VCs are, are the only way to go or let alone uh, should be the way to go. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts and, and feedback on that for the startups that are here in the, in the virtual room and, and for the other students yeah. alumni that are here? So one of the basic fundamental questions I always like entrepreneurs to think about is what kind of company you're trying to build? And that's a very important question to ask yourself. And only you can answer that as an entrepreneur. And what is your end game? Is your end game to build a unicorn slash a billion dollar business and hopefully own 10 to 15% of it and make $150 million your, your cash out. Is that your aim? And there's a certain way to build that kind of business and there's a certain funding approach to that business. Or you're trying to build a company where you know, you're happy with, a, let's say a 10 to $15 million annual revenue line, you own most of it, it's a profitable business, you probably still make you know, good salaries and take it home, uh, take dividends or whatever. But if you can answer that question for yourself as an entrepreneur, you can then figure out what your funding strategy needs to be. And different companies have to have different funding strategies. You know, uh, a lot of times people, again, and media kind of plays a very critical role in this. And we as entrepreneurs probably do too, that we, that we make VC funding really sexy and lucrative. Oh, sorry, I forgot kids. <laughs> uh, but the reality is, you know, money is money. Uh, and you, got, you need capital to run your business in the, in the most efficient way that you think is right for your business. Um, so yeah, if you're, if, you're, if you're a product company, again, sorry, Adil, I'll pick on you guys again, because uh, you're in the room. If you're a product company that needs capital to build a great product and lose, uh, lose some dollars while building it, then you should go to that path because you're trying to build a technology platform that hopefully has a lucrative exit in the future. If you're trying to build a company that I did as my second startup, which was a services slash platform company, do I need VC funding? Probably not. I need some smart angel investors to help me you know, start the business. And then we have clients who are paying most of our bills. So it really depends on you as a person. Uh, and there's no right or wrong way of doing this. And this is what I try to tell people, you know, don't get swayed by the idea that if I don't get backed by the top VC fund, my business is not good. It's not true. You know, there's some incredible businesses that never touched VC dollars. So a company that we just acquired, I'm sitting in this office, incredible business, never raised a cap, never raised a money from a dollar from a VC fund, completely ran on bank debt and runs still successfully. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to slice the pie for sure. I, yeah. I, our office was right next to uh, Enthusiast Gaming for our first year, and uh, lo and yeah. behold, the three teams startup 
is now worth two hundred million dollars on the TSX. Yeah. So you never really know what the right yeah. way is, and um, you just got to keep going. Uh, yeah. Angels are a great way, and and uh, our friends at yeah. ClearBank are also a great way. Andrew did yeah. the last yeah. talk yeah, about I think, yeah. two three months ago. So there's a lot of new ways. I think Prashant is here as well, somewhere in the the crowd yeah. runs a great VC here in Toronto called Panache. Love Prashant. There's a lot a lot of amazing options. A lot of amazing options, and um, yeah. You just have to you just have to choose the right um, the right ones. Like you know, we've 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 taken the angel route very purposely because they're closest yeah. to the health system. So there's there's never just one one uh, one answer. Yeah. That I actually sure. think uh, Belt Simple is a great example of this too. Right, Mike uh, did a very strategic thing very early on by uh, by you know basically making Power Corp one of its only funds to back the company. Mm -hmm. And Belt Simple is a household name today. Right. Uh, so, Absolutely. you know, are you going to argue that's not a good strategy for fundraising? Uh, it'll be tough. It'll be a tough argument. <laughs> yeah. If you can find, yeah, you know, I think the key, yeah. the hardest thing is actually just getting your first client or your first customer. Yeah. That's exactly. it. It's tough in Canada, I yeah. think. So if you can yeah. do that and if they can actually ante up, um, you know, with, uh, with a strategic investment, it, it doesn't get better than that. Like I look to yeah. our, our friends in the healthcare space, Maple and their recent investment by shoppers, like, it, it's synergistic and that's really what you my want. My wife was a lawyer on the deal, by the way. I was going to ask you, I, I remember being a, a lawyer. Wow. That's amazing. Congratulations she was, to her. She was on the, on the other side of it, not at Maple. Okay. <laughs> on the, awesome. on the shopper side. Hey guys, great chat. Love, love the questions. Sorry. Um, love the, uh, uh, love seeing you guys back together and, 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 and having that dialogue. Love having your kids on Daniel. That's awesome. Olivia is an amazing name. My daughter is Olivia as well too. Best Thank you. name for a daughter of all time, <laughs> Olivia. And uh, we're going to shift now and we're going to go into uh, one quick thing, then we're going to go some questions. So we've got Adol here, and I just love uh, if you could uh, give us a glimpse into, you can ask questions of Udit if you want, but you can also just give us a glimpse into um, what, uh, what it was like and what, uh, what it meant to you having his support at a key time for, for the business. Hey guys, uh, thanks for having me. I can summarize that in one sentence. Uh, it wouldn't have been possible without Mudit's support. <laughs> and what's crazy is Mudit's been supporting us pre, during, and after that time. Um, I mean, Mudit knows the story best. I, I, I think what was really the, the craziest part was we, I knew of Mudit through you, Chris. Um, you know, you assembled this community together, which I think is fantastic because Mudit and I weren't actually directly connected ever. I've never spoken to Mudit, I had never spoken to Mudit prior to actually reaching out to him. Um, I just knew of him through Shulik uh, startups. So that was fantastic. Uh, but I mean, Mudit, I mean, I, I've said this to you a thousand times. I want to say it again from everyone. Uh, nothing would have been possible without you. Oh man, you're too kind, my friend. It's all you guys, it's all the things you guys are doing. All the Instagram stories I see, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Thanks for that moment, Edel. And um, uh, it really like, uh, this was my dream actually. Like, and Vito will tell you this. I like tried to manifest this and I'm a, I believe in this kind of thing as saying things out loud over and over again and bringing them into existence. And, and I told Vito, I'm like waiting for the day where it's going to happen that a judge or a, you know, someone, or they're going to come and then they're going, and it's going to be an alumni and they're going to invest in, in, in one of the, the companies. And, um, and we, we've, we've had that now with you guys doing it. We had that with uh, Ron Seiden and Blade uh, who, who uh, got, got behind those guys. And it's amazing to see that, that taking place. Um, so thank you again. We're going we're going to take some questions now. And um, I'm, I've got uh, uh, Christine and I've got Amy and uh, I've got uh, uh, Amalia lined up. And uh, which one of you wants to jump in first? I don't mind going first. Thanks, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, thank you, Moody. Thank you, Daniel, for um, you know what you guys just did there. It was pretty much just gems throughout. Thank you so much. Um, I guess my question for you guys is, if a company is currently bootstrapping, um, when would you would you recommend that they go out for funding, and under what circumstances? And then maybe some general tips about that as well. Dan, you're building a startup, so do you want to go first? 
I mean, I, I think that the most important thing you can do is go go validate it, get clients and get advisors that really understand your space. So if you're in like health tech, go talk to uh, specialists or hospital executives or board members, people that know it really, really well, see if they're going to help you and if they're and if they will invest as well. So I would just spend a lot of time being very, very particular and purposeful with who you bring on board because you want to make sure that through hell and high water, they're going to help you and that they can bring real value and perspective that you can't necessarily get on your own. I've only been in the health space for three odd years and it does feel like 30, but there's a lot of really wise people that we've been able to get to know or have invested or contributed in some way. So I would say like, you know, if you're bootstrapping, congratulations, uh, you know, if you, if you are seeing traction and there is a good chance that you will be able to get funding, but focus on people who really understand your problem and really understand your space. Cause the last thing you want to do is be spending time talking to investors that you have to educate about the, your space and educate about your problem. Does that make sense? Yeah. And yeah. just yeah. to add to that, I think just to add, add a slightly different flavor to that, uh, just from my personal experience, I, one of the biggest mistakes I personally made at least in my first startup was not just completely understanding A, the VC business model and, and what is the process of fundraising. I just assumed that this is how it worked, but that's, you know, that was, my assumption is all wrong. The good news now is there's so much collateral that exists, good collateral put up by good VC funds that talk, tell you exactly what a VC business model is, which I think is super important to understand. Uh, not enough entrepreneurs do it. Um, and, and that allows you to then find the right investors and or VCs. I'm really talking about VCs, you're not angel investors um, uh, and do that. If you understand that process uh, and if you look through some good, uh, uh, good, good information online, why Combinator is another decent uh, source for this is you will know exactly what level you need to be for what investor and when does it make sense for them. Uh, Pair.vc actually uh, has a really good deck on this that I highly recommend everybody to look at. Uh, I forgot the name of it. Uh, Adil, Adil probably can ping you guys on, on the chat. He knows this is the deck that I'm talking about. Is uh, It talks specifically about you as an entrepreneur, who you are, your pedigree, and what kind of money you should be raising and by who. And I find that super valuable. So, you know, absorb that data. Uh, you know, there's no right or wrong answer again. You know, if, you, if I knew more about your particular startup, I may give you a very specific answer to that. But, you know, uh, I would say to make life easy for yourself, raise less money and raise it later. So you dilute yourself less and mm -hmm. raise it when you actually have real customers and validation and you're actually doing this hockey stick because you want to make it a competitive deal. Uh, and I've said a lot of interesting things here, uh, but uh, you know, try to make it a competitive deal. So everybody wants to fight for the same deal, get more allocation, and then it allows you to, uh, it will allow you to actually you know, uh, get the best uh, from the VC fund. Thank you. Super. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Ado, for dropping that in the link in the chat as well, too. And so we have a growing list of questions, getting messages from people. So Amy, Amalia, Ash, Abanoff, and Morella are up next. So Amy, over to you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, I know that you're a two-time founder, and I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about your kind of experience with um, uh, an exit or an acquisition, and how was that for you, and what was the main thing that you've learned through that journey? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I can give you both sides of it, buy and sell now, because I'm on the other side of the table now. But uh, as a, you know what, as a founder, I think uh, you should have a gut feel of when the right time is to sell. Uh, and uh, you should not have uh, remorse on it. Uh, you know, a lot of founders have remorse on it. Um, so you should not, you should, you should kind of know, first of all, when is the right time to sell because it's very important uh, as a founder. And on the other side of it, if you just look at the process, make sure you have all your documents very clean. So accounting being a big deal, all your customer contracts being a big deal, just like keep all that clean in a data dump. Uh, I'm just doing a due diligence actually on a company uh, and I'm very impressed not just by them, but the way they've organized their data for us to access. So just having a good structure on it and have a good lawyer, another, another, another important aspect of it. Um, but uh, the experience, it could, be, uh, it could be brutal, it could be, or it could be non-brutal. It really depends on A, how interested the parties are uh, and then how accessible the information is. I think the tricky part is a negotiation. How do you value yourself? If you're, if you're a company that's been killing it for a while and has a long, long track record, set valuation in the market, you know, you can at least have some sort of baseline to put a number down. But if you're not that, you're a unique startup, maybe in stealth mode, hasn't raised a lot of money, valuation becomes a sticky point. 
uh, and how do you value your company? And that's really the magic. You got to, as an entrepreneur, got to convince the, the buying party that you're worth that. Uh, and really the worth is how much money can they make in the future from your company or your software, or your product or services. So that's really the trick. Uh, did I learn the trick? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, I'm on now on the other side of it. So I am seeing startups kind of like pitch us in that way. And I'm seeing some very interesting pitches where they're you know, positioning themselves smartly to show how we can make value out of it in the future. So there's value today, but how we can 10X that value in the future. And that's, I would say, is a smart way of doing that as an entrepreneur. Sell your company, uh, not as of today, but what's, what it means in the future for that company that's acquiring you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Amalia? Thank you. So I think my question is a little bit more uh, specific than uh, the ones you've heard right now, but what I wanted to ask you about was your thoughts on, uh, you know, in context with what's happening right now, COVID and where that's going to take us in the future is the integration of technology in the supply chain, specifically the end part of it, like getting yeah. to the end consumer. And if you have any advice for startups entering the e-commerce space, let's say. Oh, Adil should answer that question. He's all over that space right now. <laughs> Chris, is he allowed to answer? Yeah, well, it's it's your fireside chat, so you can put anyone yeah. on the spot that you want. Adil, if you heard that question, you should totally answer that question. <laughs> You're in it every day. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, Amalia. I, I guess my I guess to to better understand the question and to be able to be able to provide a, a more thoughtful answer. Um, could you provide some context as to what you're asking? Like, is, are you a product company looking to ship? Are you enabling product companies to ship? Um, it'd, be, it'd be really useful to understand the context. Okay, so frankly, I'm still, I mean, first year student, so I haven't gotten that far. And I'm just trying to understand what the industry could be like, how it's shaping out, because clearly we have seen changes um, in this. So getting the, uh, the product to the end consumer, if it's yours or you know if you're enabling mm -hmm. other companies too in the last like eight months and some of these changes are kind of bound to stick mm -hmm. uh but like your thoughts on which ones would which ones wouldn't and mm -hmm. what you know a startup getting into the industry right now or in the next couple of months what mm -hmm. they should be sort of paying attention to for sure okay so I'll, I'll i'll do my best by answering in the lens of you're a platform that enables people to ship product to their shoppers' doors. I think given COVID, uh, a couple of things are happening. One is the proliferation of integrations and different app companies. So you've got, when you put yourself in the shoes of your customer, your customer being uh, someone who is shipping product. So it could be someone on Shopify. It could be, uh, you know, BJMA is a great example. Um, I'm sure if, 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 just to use BJMA as an example, because you guys are on but I'm taking your line. <laughs> um, BGMA probably has multiple integrations, right? So they've got a 3PL partner. So they're integrated with their 3PL. They're running on Shopify or might be running on some e-commerce platform. They might have a loyalty app, which might be Recharge. They might have another application that's taking care of another aspect of their business. So a lot, given what's happening with COVID, a lot more people are coming online. And what that's occurred is a lot of small integration or players are starting to grow. So the number of networks or integration points has increased immensely. So starting out as a startup, my best recommendation would be, you know, again, in the, in the lens of if you're enabling people to ship product would be to really zero in on what are the two or three or four integrations or platforms or apps that my service will be deeply integrated with. I want you to, like, I always think of it this way that if you pick a platform, you can. You need to be the best at that platform. Go vertical instead of going horizontal. Going horizontal as a startup, you're you've always got limited resources. There's only so much you can do. Uh, but going vertical and going deep allows you to really capture a lot of market share super super quick. Here's a good example. When we first started out, we were not integrated with Magento, WooCommerce, Salesforce, Commerce Cloud, or any of the other uh, commerce platforms. We actually started with Squarespace. Squarespace, Squarespace was the easiest integration for us to do. Squarespace, in our opinion, is also the smallest target market of customers, but we grew so fast in Squarespace because um, we own Squarespace. It, when anyone thought of last mile shipping on Squarespace, we had the best integrations, hands down. Then we moved on to Shopify and now we're owning Shopify. We're still not at Salesforce, e-commerce cloud or Magento or whatnot. So 
Um, my recommendation would be you can't do everything. There are always going to be trade-offs. Um, thinking about where you want to play and going vertical and going deep and winning that space is probably more important than going horizontal right now, especially in the e-commerce landscape. Yeah, and just to just add just quick context, more at a maybe uh, 20,000 feet level would be uh, the good news is that e-commerce has absolutely blown up and you can probably find the stats somewhere, but if it was supposed to grow 2X in the next 10 years, it's probably going up 30, 40X, whatever the number is. All that means really right now is that the, 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 the retailers, the brands, the supply chain was not ready for this boom. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible timing right now for smart companies to build solutions in the supply chain. But I'll, I'll pick what I'll said now is find that niche within that supply chain. Supply chain is too broad a topic uh, and it's too complicated and you can't solve everything. And if you try to solve everything, then you're going to go compete with the SAPs and the big, 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 big companies, which you're going to struggle competing with that early. Pick a niche. You know, and then go crush that niche. Uh, it could be in automation, it could be robotics, it could be in last mile like Swift, whatever that niche is. Find that niche, build a great product, find good customers, blow it up, and then start expanding. Uh, but the opportunity is now uh, because you know we just had this amazing, unfortunate but amazing boom for e-commerce. Okay, thank you, thank you both. Um, I'm going to jump over to Abhinav and then back to Ash. Thanks, Ash. Uh, hi, Mudit. Hi, Daniel. So, hey, guys. So, you know, Dr. Carl, like we are a typical marketplace and we'll have, we are, we are already started facing the chicken and egg problem. So <laughs> what advice do you have for us for the next six months? Because these six months are going to be very crucial. We have like due launching this month, end of this month. Sorry, I, I maybe miss it. What are you company? I missed the first part of this session. Dr. Carl? Oh, Dr. Carr, sorry, I missed your presentation. What does Dr. Carr do again? Can you so, just tell me quickly? We are a service marketplace for auto, of auto mechanics. So any car owner can find the right mechanic for them, book on, like book them and track the car expenses and it helps them predict the future. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to delegate this question again to Adil because he's the expert of marketplaces. Okay. <laughs> and again, he's building one. Adil, over to you. Um, hey guys, first of all, <laughs> I am going to be your number one first user. Like, my car is broken right now. And I can, like, no, I'm not kidding with you. Okay? The problem is so real. Um, this, it's such a real problem. So I'm going to be your first uh, and most loyal customer, hopefully. Um, so marketplaces. <laughs> uh, so a lot of people don't know this, but Swift is actually a marketplace. We're not a shipping company. We don't own, like, we just don't do any logistics. We enable logistics, but we do not do logistics. So in our marketplace, our demand side are, uh, or shippers like retailers and our supply side are courier companies and one of our biggest le learning lessons is you need to own the supply that's it you need to absolutely own the supply you see both you and i and or in many marketplaces whether it's uber airbnb doordash demand is already there that's why you're creating a marketplace it's how reliably cheaply and easily can you capture that demand that's just why vcs care about cac and ltv and you know things like that but none of that stuff matters right now. <laughs> what matters right now is owning the supply because if you can get the supply, then the demand will come. And here's how. Um, Rescue is actually a great example. So Rescue is a, is a company in Toronto. Um, they're also a marketplace. What they do is they provide, they connect restaurant owners with people who can repair, make restaurant, restaurant repairs. And instead of pouring so many dollars into marketing, which Personally, I'm not a good marketer and I would probably waste, you know, a million dollars and get zero, zero hits on my ads. Um, what they did is they got the restaurant, like the, the mechanics, the people who were repairing the restaurants. And I, and I don't know exactly how, but they enabled those guys in a way where every time they got a unit of supply, one unit of supply brought own, their own demand onto the platform. So it was this cyclical flywheel effect that they created. So I would argue that what you should be doing in the, over the next six months is only focusing on supply, one, two, and how you focus on supplies, create growth mechanisms that allow you to, uh, that allow you to get your mechanics to bring on their customers. 
onto your platform. So I loved what you said about, you know, we provide scheduling software to our mechanics. I think that's so smart because if you can provide scheduling software to these mechanics, well, they're going to use that scheduling software to bring on their existing customers and boom, now you've got demand. And then you grow that engine. Another area that I think could be u- really useful, because again, it doesn't ma- marketplaces are cool because it doesn't matter what vertical you're in, they usually all follow the same tactics for growth. Um, another great uh, thing that you could focus on is diversifying your supply. So mechanics are actually not a commodity product. Unlike you know, in Uber's world, drivers are, riders see drivers as commodity products. Um, even in my world, Retailers see shippers as commodity products. They do not care who's shipping it. In your world, mechanics are actually not a commodity product. If you own a high-end car, you want it in service with a high-end mechanic. If you own an EV, you want it service with an EV person. So bringing online different and specialized supply increases the value of your marketplace. And to the last, when we when we take in, you know, what we talked about in the last question, which was picking a picking a platform and then just going deep and verticalizing. One of the easiest ways to build marketplaces is to pick your niche. So maybe your niche just to start out with is we are the marketplace for EVs or we are the marketplace for high-end vehicles. And then you grow from there. Got it. I think that- And I'll I'll, I'll add something. There's two reasons. One reason why I wanted other to answer that was because of question that Daniel asked me before, you know, what do I look for entrepreneurs? If you ever notice Adil speak, he's got very specific insights around his industry. Uh, and because he spent way too much time understanding his industry. So as an entrepreneur, I think that's a key lesson, right? Become, and I, you know, you don't have to become the best expert, but understand your industry and the market really well, marketplace for you auto, all that's super important. I'll answer that specific question again through a different lens, by the way. Uh, we acquired a company right now uh, called Planet for IT, which for lack of better word in this context is a marketplace to find top technology talent and place them at our clients. Marketplace. Uh, one of our biggest clients is VMware, uh, and we absolutely crushed it last month with VMware. And one of the reasons why we crushed it with VMware was not because we have the best technology, we have the best service. It was none of that. It was we have one of the best rosters, which in our world is supply. We have some of the best VMware experts on our roster who we can take and put it into, uh, into our client. And that's what's making us win deals. So supply, you know, I've looked at this, you can skin this cat in multiple ways, but I've looked at this problem myself and I always find supply is where the magic is. If you've got good supply, customers want that, right? If you have crappy supply, uh, customers may use you, but they'll never come back to you, right? So it's a very hard problem to solve, uh, but uh, I always come back to supply in my experience. Thank, thank you so much, Adam. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mudit. This was great, yeah. If I can add my my two cents, uh, I, I liked what Adil said about being super, super focused, right? We had hundreds of practitioners join our platform, but if you can't deliver on experience far more than 9.5 times out of 10, and the end consumer cannot depend on you consistently for that service, it's going to be very difficult for you to scale. So just make sure they can rely on you for one thing. If it's just winter tires, then make it winter tires. Mm. And then focus on something else the next season and be very specific and really sp- spend a lot of attention, uh, excuse me, spend a lot of time with your customers to know what those, uh, those um, complementary services are. And it do also something, something interesting, which I would say is actually make that your business personally, just based on our experience with that, uh, with medicine again, and our, our B2B pivot is help them service their existing customers and create a B2B business out of it. And the reason is, is marketplaces are very tough to build and scale. They're very tough to fund. In Canada, it's even more difficult. And in healthcare, it's even more difficult. So if, I'm, if I'm taking a bit of a more jaded perspective, it's because we've lived through two marketplaces. One was acquired by Groupon, and one obviously just didn't really fit the times um, with all the changes. So you just have to get really close to your customers. And if you have an opportunity of, of selling them something month over month where there's long LTV and there's a low opportunity for, for there to be friction or churn, I would say go and build that business before you promise them that you're going to find them new cl- customers. Yeah, it goes to the same conversation in the previous ch- chat, which was verticalization, right? Find that. So going broad, go go deep in that vertical, become expert, become really good at that. And then think about going somewhere else. Um, thank I think you. Jiffy, I think Jiffy is a great example. I'll get my car fixed. Love, love <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Did, a, did a really great job and like, you know, okay. again, the version is like yeah. is chopper and 
like there's a lot of a lot of ways to slice the pie but i would simply say like you know with, with chippy you know you do one visit you have to really earn that customers um you know business for them to come back as opposed to the flip side is give the home repair person the software that they need to run their own mm -hmm. business so just two different ways of slicing it and it depends on what the depends on a lot of factors that we can't necessarily cover in the next two minutes but um oh wow yeah. <laughs> that flew by you serve them well wasn't it fun so so nice to yeah. have you back yeah know, dude. thanks for having me guys this is awesome no happy to take more questions by the way if you've got time well now we, we have a we have a, a a final thing that we do that's one of our traditions for our our vips when they come out and speak which is we like to go around the room and we will go for um some closing thoughts on what people are taking away from listening to you and what it meant uh to them to have you come out and and be with us uh and so uh i'm going to ask uh to mash to kick us off and then if you're if you want to go up next you just send me a private message in chat and i'll line you up uh, for your thank you so Dimash, you can start off yeah good evening uh great great talk thank you so much for your story and for the insights that you shared today because uh these kind of stories are are, are kind of giving you the reality of entrepreneurship and they uh they provide you with with the picture of what to expect so I think this is really valuable when people like you share this kind of, you know, ups and downs of this journey. So to get to, to, to so we can get so we can get the, you know, uh, proper expectations. So thank you so much for that. And uh, yeah, we wish you, wish you all the best with, with all your initiatives and businesses and hope to connect and see you in the future. Thanks, man. Thanks, Dimash. Uh, Leah? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, to also say thank you. It was actually an extremely timely conversation. Um, I have a lot of retail companies in the portfolio that I manage at work, and we were having the discussion of, you know, is, is B2C going to be all the way to the future? Because there's so many challenges, COVID mostly related with B2B. So hearing your insights in the retail industry and kind of some of those same challenges you've gone through, um, echoed some of our thinking so it was very interesting and uh also wanted to to say thank you for some of i think the realities that you brought like you said it, it you know people can always come off as it's always sunshine and rainbows in the journey so i like when when people give some some reality and some of the challenges you've gone through thank you tom said thanks chris uh hi mudit um i i wanted to thank you uh, so a bit of a context, I'm leading the Schulich Ventures Club this year and a lot of the activities at the club, uh, a lot of the questions that I get to hear, I have my own aspirations as well. A lot of things that I think about is it revolves around the, the starting uh, of a startup, like how, how do we start? How do I take the journey forward? How, how, how should we look at the first six months? And I just wanted to thank you for sharing a lot of insights. Uh, about how people from the other side of the table think. I think that's going to be very valuable for me and for the people at Shulik Ventures Club. Thank you. Thanks. Amy. I just want to say thank you, Mudit, and also Adele for your great insights. And Daniel, that was some great uh, moderating as well. Thank you for bringing your daughters on. That was really cute. I didn't um, invite them, but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, it's so important when alum come back and share your insights and your personal like experiences in your journey with um, the current students and also the current, um, I guess, the new crop of founders and entrepreneurs at Shulig. It really is, you know, your continued support that keeps this ecosystem going and growing. So um, I really appreciate you guys coming out tonight and doing this with us. It was a really great experience. And I, I had a quick question that I asked Chris earlier if I could ask. So I'm going to ask it now. And then you, you just can give me like one sentence. So I just wanted to ask you three um, if you had to recommend one single book for another founder or entrepreneur, uh, what would it be? Was that for me? Um, for you, Daniel and. Oh, uh, there you go. That's you. <laughs> this is what I'm reading right now. It's, it's called Build Your Dream Network. And, you know, like I, I'm looking at it, right? Like what, what, Chris and Vito and the whole team have created, like it's it's amazing. You know, people have shared values, similar passions. Every every single one of you here wants to help the other. So like that's what I'm reading right now, and I think it's so special. And in part, our our pivot was inspired by this community. To be honest with you, 
because it doesn't exist in healthcare at all. They need the other stuff like software and whatnot, but you know, it, that it was a great inspiration and this group continues to inspire me every time. So I think it's so amazing the the number of people and and uh, that that attend. It's it's so cool to see every month. Yeah, for me, the first one that I actually read was "Hard Things About Hard Things" from Ben Horowitz, which I think still kind of remains a really really interesting book. Uh, sometimes I go back to it. Uh, more recently, I've kind of uh, been driven more towards autobiography. I love you know sort of understanding the journey that entrepreneurs take. Uh, so that's what I do, but that's just a personal choice. Uh, but hard things about hard things was really, really interesting for me uh, when I started building the company. I, I forgot to mention what the book was. It's called Build Your Dream Network by J. Kelly Huey. I'm just going to put it in the chat below. Madi, you want to put yours too? Yeah, I got to find a way to do it, but I will. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's probably being on this iPad. Awesome. Christine and Simon. Hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much to all three of you, actually, uh, Mudit, uh, Daniel, and Adil. Um, it's, we, we don't, like our friends in our network or immediate network and friends and families aren't entrepreneurs. So it's really, really hard to kind of commiserate and celebrate, you know, all the ups and downs. So this is actually amazing. Um, we really appreciate it. And Mudit, um, one of the questions I actually had initially was, um, you know, how, how do you, how do you get through the ups and downs? And you actually, I guess, read my mind and you answered it by just saying that you have to be passionate about the problem you're solving. And that's, you know, just, I guess, reaffirmed it for me, but that's exactly what it is. And, um, and I guess that's what it is for, for all entrepreneurs. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you guys. It's tough, right? It's tough, but uh, if you're passionate about it, you can, you can wake up in the morning and, you know, get back at it. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Rupesh. Rupesh, did you want to go next? Okay, I lost Rupesh. Um, so I will, uh, I wanted to like ask just some um, as a couple more things are coming in the chat. One of my favorite parts of every session that we have is hearing from Ahmed from Zeifman. So I was wondering if you might give a thought because you always are so great at wrapping things up and putting like a perspective on everything we've heard in the evening. Hey, hi, Chris. Sorry to interject. Uh, uh, can I go next before? Oh, before Rupesh is here. Okay, Rupesh. Yeah, sorry. We will get you in uh, and then we'll go to Ahmed. Sure. So, um, so I'm just in my first term, honestly. So uh, about to finish my second month in Shulik. So the first thing that I always ask myself is like, what do you need to start a startup basically? And thanks to Daniel and Modit, like I've got my secret sauce today. So it's be passionate about the problem you wish to solve and just have the domain experience. So I think, I, uh, I mean, I am getting the best out of the event and uh, like always Chris and Tamzid and Vito and team, they've put such an amazing event. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking probably by the time I'm done with my first year, probably I'll be ready to form, you know, start my first company as, as well. So, uh, good luck to you guys. Love it. That's awesome, man. Good luck to that. Thanks. Come thanks back and me. tell us all about it. Definitely. Okay. We're going to have Ahmed come now. Thank you so much, uh, Mudit. It was a ex really exciting conversation. I really enjoy uh, these events with Shulik, and uh, tonight's was no, no exception. Daniel, you really steered this conversation. Uh, from the background of entrepreneur and, and how we can make the most out of it. I really enjoyed uh, you know, the question and answer session. Uh, what, what, uh, one thing which I would like to add to the conversation, which was very you know, helpful to a lot of entrepreneurs is uh, knowing the network, knowing the Shulik community, I would uh, urge everybody who is starting out and have a startup and are facing with any issues or problems, do not, be, uh, you know, do not hesitate to reach out. Uh, and most of the community members here have, are always uh, really welcoming and, and, and uh, are willing to volunteer their time and, and um, you know, provide that advice. So do not be shy and just reach out when you need somebody's advice. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, you will find that most of these guys have already gone through similar challenges, similar problems, have solved those problems for themselves, and they are willing to help out. So that would be my one last piece of advice. I'm a proud Zyphon's client, by the way. There you go. Nice. 
I'd love to hear it. They do a great job, don't they, Daniel? And it's like, you know, there's really like a- and, and they've been really amazing. So thank you, Ahmed. Chris, I just want to add something quickly before I forget. Um, you know, we always, every time we do these panels, we always talk about this beautiful world of entrepreneurship. We've discussed how hard it is. Um, I recently did a podcast with Sun Life uh, and the topic of discussion, which nobody ever talks about is financial stress of being an entrepreneur. Uh, and you know, this is this this for some reason entrepreneurs don't share this, but building a company is is hard, but the financial side of it personally is harder sometimes. Uh, so I talk a lot about that in that specific podcast, my personal struggle with money while building a company. So if you guys are really interested in that side, you know, it's it's if you type my name, some like you'll probably find it. Uh, the, the reason I also brought that up was the reason why I got into that podcast was because my the marketing manager at my first startup is now at Sun Life. Uh, and, and she's in charge of the podcast. And, you know, coming back to Dan's Power Up Network, uh, as she became part of that podcast community, the first thing she did was call me and said, you should be part of the story. So, uh, A, you know, don't be, don't be afraid of sharing your story and B, keep the network uh, always engaged because, you know, they'll always come back and provide you with the ways to share your story. So, um, you know, if you guys want to listen to it, you know, I'm happy to also share the link, but finance is very hard. Uh, but don't take it too hard on yourself. Everybody deals with it. Uh, and, 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 you know, you got to find a way to, to even uh, solve those problems from a personal standpoint. Yeah, we'll definitely check that out. And if anyone wants the link for that, I've, I've got that as well. I can, I can share it around. Um, I'm Myra, I'm no pressure, but I'm going to give you the last word from the, from the group tonight, and then I'm going to wrap it up. Oh, that's a lot of pressure. Ahmed always wraps it up the best, so I, I can't top that. But um, thank you all so much. I always learn so many new things um, through all of these events, and it always like shocks me the caliber of people that come on here. I know all of you have really busy schedules, and just your commitment to actually give back to the community means a lot. Um, the, just the Shulik startup community has been growing so fast, um, and I'm, you know, all of us are really thankful for your support. Um, Modita, I just want to reiterate your point, one of the first points you made around execution and vision, right? So, like, as founders, we all have these really great visions and, and, and like, this need to make really big impact, but you always have to step back and think about execution. What am I actually doing to achieve that? And, and Adil, obviously, your company is a great example of that. So, um, really great for all of you guys to come together and contribute to that, um, that insight. And, yeah, thank you again so much. Awesome. Thank you. Wonderful words to wrap up. Um, Vito, we're going to give a final closing thanks to the sponsors here tonight um, who made the whole thing possible and have been behind us every step of the way. So thanks to everyone for your support. Um, the foundation, the Hellier Foundation, um, wonderful uh, contributions that they've made now for three years in a row uh, to helping us out. Zeifmans, Will the Board Delise, Bearskin and Parr, appreciate all of you, Best Indochino. Yspace, um, really uh, count on you guys for the support and to make the impact to give back in terms of your services and your contributions for the startup company. So thank you. Um, Vito is going to play us out with uh, the video as we go. And um, we're going to say thank you for another startup night, Shulik Startup Night 14. March 11th is going to be the next one, number 15. I feel us creeping in slowly on 20. This is starting to feel like WrestleMania. Like remember when WrestleMania started with <laughs> WrestleMania one and two, but then eventually got to be WrestleMania 49, or I don't know what they're at now, but we're going to get to wrestle. We're going to get to Shulik Startup 9 49, 49 one day, and it's going to be glorious. All right, Vito, play us out.
Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate all of you. And um, you're the guys who keep everything moving and building the men and women who are part of this Shula community who make it amazing. And thanks for everything that you're doing. We're having a great time. We're having fun. 2021 is going to be the most amazing year ever. Thank you and have a great night. Thank you.